Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my lecture number 23. Today we talk about solar power towers. If you have looked at my previous lectures, you know already what it is. Last time we talked about the solar tough, which focuses the sunlight in one dimension. And this time we talk about the solar power tower. This focuses the light in two dimensions and therefore it's more effective. You can reach higher temperatures with that. I guess most of you have played as a child with magnifying glasses. I brought one for you here today. So these magnifying glasses work in a similar way. They focus the light in two dimensions. So physically it's nothing else than a focusing lens, but you can also call it a burning lens. Why is that? If the sun is over there and you put it into the sun, then you see there's a focusing spot. There's a spot of the sun on my hand. And this spot can get very hot because all the solar power which enters the lens is focused on one small spot. The most extreme device in this direction is the solar ferrets in France. So it's a solar oven and the picture is shown here. So it's a huge parabolic mirror. So it works the same as a large focusing length. But this is not the only thing which is happening here because in addition there is a field of heliostats. So mirrors which can be tilted in two orientations and they can always follow the track of the sun. And this way the solar irradiation which hits all these heliostats will then be focused on these parabolic mirrors at this building here and then focused a second time on the focus. And the best way to explain it is to use this diagram here over there. There you see how the sunlight is coming in parallel down from the sky. Then it's focused on this big heliostat field to the direction of this second mirror and the second parabolic mirror then focuses all the sunlight, so all the energy on one spot. So this spot can get very hot. In this device, temperatures of 3500 degrees Celsius are reached. And the total power which hits this hot spot is about one megawatt. So it's really a huge facility to reach very high temperatures and have a lot of thermal energy. You might think this is a solar power station and a sustainable device, but this is unfortunately not the case. The main purpose of this device here is to use high temperatures for material tests and it was mainly thought for material tests of nuclear ballistic missiles and of explosions of nuclear bombs because in these two cases you have a very high temperature gradient where suddenly very high temperatures appear and people wanted to test if the uh, missiles and all the other military material stems these heat changes. So from the purpose of building that, this is nothing which has to do with renewable energies. But of course, this is a device which is 100% CO2 free, which produces a lot of solar energy for some purposes. So how to make electrical power now out of the solar light? Well, you do basically the same. And instead of just heating up some metals and melt them, you can produce electricity out of it by heating up, for example, water and produce steam and then the steam produces electricity in turbines. So on this picture here you see again the solar power stations close to Sevilla in Spain. You see these big mirror fields. There are two of them. One is called PS10, the other is called PS20 and they produce 11 and 20 megawatt of electrical power nominally. So how are they built? The power station in front is a small one. The power station behind is still in construction. You see that only a part of the mirror field is equipped with mirrors. And this is the larger one, which nowadays produces 20 megawatts. The towers are about 140 meters high. On top of the tower, then there's a solar receiver. So this is this dark black material which absorbs the sunlight and then converts it into heat. And this material then is cooled with water and then the water is heated up this way and steam is produced at high temperatures. And this high temperature steam then goes to the 
generators which are downstairs below the tower. Here you see a side view of the same power stations. The tower in front is in operation and you see how the light is focused onto the absorber in the tower on the back side so you can't see the absorber. And behind you see there is the second tower in construction but you can see that there is already a focus scene in the sky which is just produced by the mirror field where all the mirrors focus on one imaginary point in the sky and you see the light is so bright that you really see it from the side which means that part of the light is diffusely scattered in the air and in the dust particles in the air and therefore you can see these light rays. The next solar power station which I want to show you is here. This is a power station in California. It has a total of about 400 megawatts and there are three of these towers with each of them have their own mirror field. If you compare it to the power station in Sevilla, the main difference is that here the mirror field is all around the tower. This is possible because in this area the sun comes from such a steep angle that it makes sense to have the powers all around. If the sun has a smaller angle, if you go further to the north on our planet, then it only makes sense to have the mirrors behind. So if we go back to the power station in Sevilla, there you see the mirror field is only in the north of the tower because only in the north you can reflect the sun if it goes with a steep angle efficiently back to the tower. You also see that in this power station here in California there are three towers and three mirror fields. One could ask the question why didn't they make one big tower and a huge mirror field and then they would need only one turbine and one generator. Well the reason is easy because at some point, if you go further and further outside from the tower, the path length of your light becomes longer and longer. And the point is that close to the ground, especially in a desert area, there is more dust in the air. So the further away the mirrors are, the longer is the path where the sunlight has to pass close to the surface up to the tower. And dust means that part of the light is absorbed and scattered and therefore at some point the light doesn't arrive anymore efficiently. And therefore there is a limitation on the maximum size which these mirror fields can have. So in other words, mirror fields as you see them here on this picture are roughly the maximum size which is possible. So that means that a typical solar power tower station has on the order of 100 megawatt of power or 150. Larger doesn't make sense, then it's more efficient to build a second one. So if you want to have a huge electricity production with solar power towers, you just copy a lot of these solar power towers in the desert and each of them has on the order of 100 to 200 megawatt. These power towers here are constructed in a way that you feed them like the one in Spain with water. The water is heated up in the receiver in the absorber on top of the power tower and where hot steam is produced. The steam has a temperature here of 550 degrees Celsius so it's really overheated steam at very high pressure and with that you run generators and you produce electricity. There are two minus points of this power stations here. One is they don't have any storage. So as soon as the sun goes down, they cannot produce electricity anymore. And the second point is the way they operate it is that they start up in the morning with natural gas. So they use a lot of natural gas to heat up everything to the working temperatures. And only afterwards they use the solar mirrors to continue for the rest of the day to produce electricity with solar power. So in overall the gas consumption is rather high here so that it's only a partial solar power station in a way.
Now we come to the next power station. This one here is also in the US and it's in Las Vegas. This is also a huge power plant. It has 110 megawatt, so similar like the previous one. But this uses a different technology. So first of all, you also see the mirrors are all around the tower. In total, it's 10,000 heliostats. Each of these heliostats, each of these big mirrors has 115 square meter of mirror area and the total area is about one square kilometer. In contrast to the previous power stations, these ones here don't use water to take away the heat from the receiver, but they use molten salt. So you take cheap salt from the fertilizer industry, you heat it up and once it's liquid, then you pump it up to the tower and you use it in the receiver and this way the salt is additionally heated up and then the hot salt goes down the tower and there it can be stored in big tanks. So this is the big advantage of this power station here. You have big tanks of liquid salt where you can store the heat. The heat storage which they can do is one gigawatt hours. So if they produce 100 megawatt that means they have enough heat to have 10 hours full load. 10 hours times 100 megawatt makes one gigawatt hour. So this is great. That means that this power station can produce electricity 24 hours a day. It can also produce electricity on demand, which means that it can at some point produce more electricity and some point use less depending on the demand. So for example, in the evening hours, they can produce more heat by using more of this thermal heat storage. And then for the rest of the night, they could ramp it down if they want. So the nice thing here in this concept is that in contrast to most of the thermal storage, where you have either thermal oil or water as first heating substance in the receivers, you don't need an additional heat exchanger to heat up your salt, but here the hot salt is immediately heated up in the receiver so that you save efficiency in this way. There's one big downside of this power station. After about four years of operation, this power station was turned off and is not used anymore nowadays. The reason which you can look up is that First of all, the power generation was not as efficient as predicted. Secondly, photovoltaics became very cheap in the last years so that it cannot compete with photovoltaics. And another reason, of course, is also probably that in the Trump era, it was wanted to see the failure of solar power. So one could imagine uh, that it's also had some impact on this power station. So the situation today is there's a nice power station in the desert which could be operated, but it is not operated. Instead, people in America use fossil fuels, they use fracking gas and nuclear power, and there's nobody who runs this power station here. Compared to photovoltaic, of course, this kind of solar power is not as cheap as photovoltaics. However, you have to keep in mind that this power station can produce electricity in the evening after sunset and it's placed not far from Las Vegas. And you can imagine how much electrical power there is needed in Las Vegas, for example. But in the, let's call it in the capitalistic system we have, and especially in the US they have, they don't care so much about global effects. Instead, they just don't use the possibility to produce electricity here and instead they use fossil fuels. Now let's come to the next solar power tower. This one I think you also have seen in one of my lectures before already. This one is in South Africa. It produces 50 megawatt and you see the mirror field in the tower. You also see the tower has receivers on four sides. So the different mirror fields from the different orientations focus on a different receiver each time. In the previous power station, you see the receivers is available from all sides. Whereas in 
Spain, for example, you have only one side of receiver. So these are the technical details which depend on the technology they use. In this case, here in South Africa, they produce superheated steam again up to 530 degrees Celsius. So in principle, this one here is a follow-up project of the power stations which have been built in Spain by the same company, which got bankrupt at some point. But here the government was reasonable enough to continue the operation of the power station here in South Africa using a local energy provider. So this is a 50 megawatt power station. The point I want to make here at this position is that of course a concentrated solar power station needs more manpower than photovoltaics because the mirrors have to be cleaned regularly and the operation of the turbines and the generator has to be supervised. So this kind of power station is more labor intensive than photovoltaics. On the other hand, especially in these areas here, people are looking for jobs and they are happy to get jobs and the labor is also not so expensive. In total, one can say that these solar power stations, and this is, I think, also very important from the economic and social point of view, has a lot of local value, which means that not only the manpower flows back into the local society, but also the construction and the production of the modules can all be to a very large extent locally because the technology of these solar power towers is twofold. One part is the production of the mirror field and the second part is the production of the receiver and the generators. At least the mirror field is a technology which is quite low technology. So producing glass for mirrors is similar than producing glass for cars, for example. It's the same kind of industry. And these glass factories can be done locally anywhere, basically. The same is with the remote control of the mirrors. This is all very simple nowadays. The receivers are high technology. The point is that the receivers become very hot and therefore you need new materials and still a lot of that is, is a research field nowadays. And then turbines and generators also are standard technology which are used in any coal power plant as well. So in other words, solar power towers have a high component of local value, whereas photovoltaics, most of the cost of photovoltaics goes in the production of the solar cells. And this is normally a high-tech business, which is almost 100% done in Asia nowadays. And mainly in China. Now we come to another power station and this is a solar power tower in Jülich in Germany. So that is again the area where I was born and which is close to Weisweiler. You might remember from one of the lectures this is where this lignite plant was which I showed you. So what should I say about this solar power tower in Jülich? Well basically it's the worst position you can build a solar power tower because of course in my home area there is a long winter, there are lots of clouds, even in the summer it's raining every day, no not every day but um, quite frequently. So this is certainly one of those positions where CSP should not be built. Nevertheless this solar power tower is still very important because this solar power tower is just a research station they also produce electricity, but that is not the main point. So you see the tower here, which has an absorber on the top. And on the other side here, you see the mirror field. It's not as big as the power stations I showed you before, but still it has a sizable mirror area and electrical power. So why do I say this is a good point to study solar power towers? One of the problems with solar power is that if there's a field of clouds passing by, then immediately there's a big gradient of change. So the power is reduced suddenly to almost zero. And then after the cloud has passed, the solar power ramps up within seconds. This is of course from the technological point a challenge because 
the temperatures in the receiver change abruptly at that point in all these thermal cycles or the transport of the fluid which transport the energy and the temperatures in all the devices change suddenly and that is something which you have to study and in this power tower here in Mulich you can study that almost every day because we have almost every day clouds but if you put a tower into the desert in Nevada for example uh, there are months of no clouds and you have to wait a quarter of a year maybe for the next clouds passing. So this is not the right environment to do really research on that. This power tower in Mulich is being extended. So there are several absorbers nowadays. And the absorber which you see here in the picture is special in the way that it doesn't use water. It doesn't use liquid salt, no thermo oil. Instead, it just uses air. So with what is happening there, there's some ceramics field. So in the following picture, you see better. This is a picture I took when I visited this tower once. It's not fully in operation here, but there's some reflecting light which hits the absorber. And here you see the absorber plates, which are some kind of ceramics. And the way this receiver works is air is sucked in behind this ceramic plates. While the sun hits these ceramics, they get very hot. And then the air stream which goes through the ceramics is then heated up so that at the other side then you have very hot air inside and this hot air then can be used to heat up water and to run a turbine. The other nice thing here is you can store the heat one way to do it is that you suck in this hot air and then you blow this hot air through sand. So the sand gets very hot and then you can store the hot sand, which is very cheap as you can imagine. And then at a later stage when you need back the heat, you pump cold air through the sand and the cold air becomes hot and you can use this hot air then to run your turbines. So this is one of the new technologies which are being studied. There's a vast variety of storing heat. One which is also studied here, here is to store heat in concrete or stones by running the hot air through holes in the concrete. So there's really a big field of research being done. One big field of course is material research because the temperatures in this solar power towers can easily go up to about thousand degrees Celsius, even beyond. And there you are at the limit which can be handled by our current technology in a cost efficient way. Here you see a picture which I made from the mirror field. So you see in this power tower, the mirrors are rather small, much smaller than we saw it in the US devices, for example, or in the ones from Spain. Also here you have to do an optimization. If you have huge mirrors, you have a large wind load and it's more complicated to focus the large mirrors on one spot and also to keep control of the position. Therefore, if you have huge mirrors, you need large stands, strong stands. But if you have small mirrors, you can have simple stands which are cheap and each of them can be separately remote controlled and Remote control nowadays is not expensive anymore. So also here there's a question of how to optimize the mirror field. If you talk about the mirror field, of course, the main point is how to focus it. So you can study to focus with cameras or lasers. You can think about a lot of ideas. One point here is always the wind. If there's a wind, then the focusing position changes. Another point about focusing is that if you have a good mirror field, you can really produce a small spot of the sun on the absorber. But this is not really what you want because then in this small spot, the temperature becomes so hot that it melts the structures. So instead what they do in Ulis is they have a system which controls the mirrors in a way that the plane of absorber is more or less isothermal so that not all mirrors focus in the center but they focus in a way that the whole area has the same temperature and you get the optimal value of efficiencies. So there are a lot of 
the search areas which are still not in a phase where you could say um, now you build thousands of these solar power stations in the world or you say it's too expensive you still have to do further research further development you have to build further prototypes because only then you find new ideas to get the costs for those devices down and you have to still think about what is the best technology it's the best technology to suck in ambient air because this of course can go to any temperature or you use water steam at hot temperatures there you are limited because otherwise the pressure becomes too hot you can use molten salt molten salt has the advantage that it can be easily stored but also the option to heat up sand is a very cheap way of storing thermal heat so there are still a lot of options and there's a complete second field of research and this is to do direct chemical reactions in the tower so not only to produce heat which is going to a steam turbine but you can use chemical reactions to produce for example hydrogen from water directly in a thermochemical way without using electrolysis and without producing electricity before so if we now compare a solar trough to a solar power tower as i told you there's at least one difference where the solar power tower is better and that is the higher temperature and going with the higher temperature there's a higher efficiency in the electricity production why is that well for that we have to do a few minutes of physics again and we have to understand what a Carnot efficiency is let's start from the beginning let's take here our one kilogram stone again which i showed you several times already in this lecture so any material also this stone here has a so-called thermal capacity what does it mean well if you want to heat it up you need a certain amount of energy and this energy then goes into the stone as thermal energy okay now it's clear i guess it's very natural to say that the hotter the stone is the more energy there is actually in physics you can calculate that the amount of energy in the stone is proportional to its temperature as long as you give the temperature in the right unit which is kelvin but of course you can convert that again back into celsius if there's a very hot stone it has a lot of energy but also if the stone has room temperature it has energy so how can i get out the energy out of the stone which is at room temperature and their physics says that is not easily possible and you cannot use it to produce electricity for example and the and the physics laws which is behind that tells you that you can only produce electricity from heat when you have at least two temperatures so you have for example a hot stone and a cold environment then you can connect the stone to a thermal engine and produce electricity from it and the efficiency of this electricity production becomes larger and larger the bigger the temperature difference is so it's not only the temperature of the stone which defines how much energy there is in it but you need a temperature difference and only the temperature difference then allows you to produce electricity from the energy in the stone and that's where we come to the formula of Carnot. He found out that if you have an engine which produces electricity from heat, can get out the energy of this hot material only with a certain efficiency, and this efficiency is given according to this formula here. Eta C means the Carnot efficiency, named after Carnot. And delta T is the temperature difference between the hot point and the cold point. For example, the hot stone and the cold environment. And divided by the temperature of the hot stone plus 273 degrees Celsius, if you want to give it in Celsius. If you give it in the physics unit for temperature, which is Kelvin, uh, the formula is even more easy. So let's take an example. If the low temperature is, for example, 40 degrees Celsius, you are in the desert and it's 40 degrees outside, and you heat up your solar power stations on a trough 
So typically it's 390 degrees Celsius, then you take the formula and what comes out is an efficiency of 53%. So the maximum physically possible efficiency for, the, for a steam engine is 53%. If you go to a power tower, then you can get higher temperatures, for example 950 degrees Celsius. And then if you put it into the formula, you find out that the efficiency now is 74%. This is of course not the real efficiency of the engine you buy by a company, but this is the maximum you can get out of it from physics reasons. So there's a limitation. And in one of the later lectures, I will explain you more about this Carnot efficiency, because this Carnot efficiency is very important also if you want to have air conditioning and heating of houses, that becomes even more important. But already here from these two examples, you see a power tower has typically higher efficiency just for physics reasons because of the high temperatures. So this is already the end of this lecture. We talked about concentrated solar power and especially about power towers. Just to summarize, the concentrated solar power has the possibility of thermal storage in an easy way. You heat something up by the sun and you store this heated material somewhere and then on demand you can produce power, electricity. So power on demand is one of these characteristics of CSP. And that is a big advantage of CSP compared to photovoltaic. If you have photovoltaic, you produce immediately electricity. If you want to have photovoltaic electricity at night, you need a separate storage, for example, battery storage, which is more expensive. So that is the big plus point of concentrated solar thermal power. The next point is high efficiencies because it absorbs the whole electromagnetic spectra. It also absorbs infrared and ultraviolet, which is not so easily possible in photovoltaics. The costs are decreasing. For that I have this diagram here. This shows you the concentrated power costs from the projects which have been done in the last 10 years. So it starts at 2010. There the average cost were, and the points show you the fluctuations of different projects, but here the so-called levelized cost of energy. So if you take into account the financing and everything over the full lifetime of the power plant and you got something 10 years ago of 35 US cents per kilowatt hour. And today the cost went down significantly. So the blue points on the right side are the more new projects. And then there are also these orange points. The orange points are data from an auction database. So you see that the planned projects become even cheaper nowadays, down to about 7.5 US dollar cent per kilowatt hour. So there you see that there's a large decrease of costs nowadays. And this curve certainly will go down because there's just a few of these projects available nowadays and it's not produced and hundreds and thousands of power stations yet. And only then you will see the full cost decrease. The gray band, by the way, gives you the average costs of fossil power stations. So you see that with fossil power stations, concentrated solar power can start to compete, at least in good areas. So also commercially, there is an attraction. And then, of course, in view of decarbonization and sustainability. Of course, concentrated solar power has a huge advantage compared to fossil fuels. The next point I also explained to you already, there is a high local value because this is low technology to a large extent and it produces jobs. Another thing which is not so well developed yet, but which is also part of the research process at the moment is that this concentrated solar power is not only useful for electricity production, but you can also produce process heat for chemical processes. So if you have a chemical industry which needs a lot of heat at high temperatures, this is also the way to go. And last not least, of course, 
you can produce hydrogen from water directly in a catalytic way at high temperatures without going through electrolysis and without having the production of electricity at all. So in principle you can imagine that in the future you use solar power where you put in water and you get out hydrogen immediately and this in principle in a very efficient way. But the technology for that is still under development because you need catalyzers and you need high temperatures. So this is something which is a big task for chemical engineers and general engineers. So if you go to a desert country, the cost for solar thermal heat at high temperatures will be very good. It's about one cent per kilowatt hour, so this is cheaper than any other way to produce process heat. The worldwide capacity of CSB is rising. So here on the right you see a diagram which shows you the total megawatt peak power of concentrated solar power. It started about 15 years ago again. The first prototypes were from the 70s during the oil crisis. But then due to the drop of the oil prices it stagnated and only in the late 80s there were solar power stations built again and this time with the motivation of climate change and decarbonization and there was a steep rise of CSP power planes in the 2000s and 10s and then the steep rise went down to a smaller slope again because that was the point when photovoltaics became very cheap and this is a competing technology, at least if you don't need power at night. This is now in principle the end of the CSB section. But before we stop the lecture, I would like to point out one more kind of project. This is the so-called solar updraft tower, which I just want to mention because many people mix it up or compare it to the solar towers because here also you have solar power and you have a big tower, but this is not the same technology. The technology which is shown here is a very nice idea and a very simple method in principle. So how do you do it? Well, you have one big chimney, a huge chimney, which is nothing else than an empty pipe. So it's a chimney. And at the ground there you have a huge roof of glass. Yeah, so it's like a greenhouse. So I have a huge area which is completely covered with glass in an airtight way. And what happens in this big area is that when the sun is shining, then the sunlight goes through the roof to the ground. The ground is black. There the sunlight is converted into heat. So it heats up the ground and it heats up the air between the ground and the glass roof. The easiest way to explain it is in the next diagram here. So here you see a cut view of the chimney. Then there's this blue roof visible here on the picture. So the cold air which is originally under the roof becomes warmer and warmer. And because warm air is lighter than cold air, the air goes up and it goes up into the chimney. So the chimney works like every other chimney as well. And because the air in the chimney is hot and the tower is very high, there's a strong pressure gradient. So there's a suction of air and the air goes up. The hotter and the more sun there is, the stronger the airflow is. And if the tower is very high, you go into an area in the atmosphere which is colder and where the pressure is smaller. And that means this way the suction becomes even bigger and you get a strong wind going up the chimney. And the next thing then is you put wind turbines into the chimney and from the suction of the air you produce wind power and this wind power you convert to electricity. So this is a very simple method. And there's another clue. If you put bags of water into this greenhouse under the glass roof, these bags become also hot during the day. And then at night when the air outside is getting cold and there's no sunlight anymore, there's still the heating of these water bags. 
So this way you have a simple storage of energy. So it's a thermal storage and this continues then the wind going up the chimney and so the production of the wind power in the turbines. This is also a concept where you have in principle power day and night. So this is a rather nice idea and you have seen the picture here which shows that there has been a prototype built but this was only a small prototype. If you do the calculations you find out that to do it efficiently you have to have towers which are about thousand meters high so it's really the highest buildings ever done basically and still the efficiency of this device is very low. If I remember correctly it's just a, a few percent efficiency so most of the solar power is wasted in this device. The other problem might be that um, due to this strong hot wind which goes up more than 1000 meters in the atmosphere, you change microclimate, so you get additional winds which produce turbulences in the area. So the natural layers of warm air on the ground level and then a slow decrease of temperature with height will then be disturbed in this 1000 meter high chimneys and you get a mixture of hot and cold air there, so that might also have effects on the ecosphere, for example. So I'm very skeptical and I don't think um, this is a way to go. Also the thousand meter high towers are difficult to construct. They have to stand storms and hurricanes in principle, depending on where you build them. I think especially nowadays where you have photovoltaic and concentrated solar power, that is a technology which is much more efficient and much more easy to produce. So this is now the end of this lecture today and I think next time it's time to discuss photovoltaics which I have mentioned so often in this previous lectures. Thank you and hope to see you again at the next lecture. Goodbye.